Good morning. Thank you all for coming. So we at the Milken Institute do sessions on gender and diversity broadly all over the world where we conduct our conferences. So I thought I'd frame this by telling you a little story. So a writer, Roosevelt Thomas, who was a professor and an early writer on diversity issues in the workforce generally, wrote a story about an elephant and a giraffe who were colleagues. And they initially were very distrustful of one another because the other looked so different than the, what they were used to seeing. But they eventually became friends and decided they were going to have each other over for dinner. So the giraffe came over to the elephant's house, which was built to accommodate the elephant's family. And he couldn't fit through the door. So the elephant said, well, you'll just have to get shorter or just stick your head in and leave the rest of yourself outside. And they said, well, let's, let's change. Let's go to your house. So then when they went to the giraffe's house, the, tall, the door was quite tall and narrow, but the elephant couldn't fit through. And the giraffe said, well, just stick your snout through and then leave the rest of you outside. And they decided, well, this isn't going to work at all, so why don't we just stay outside? And I think it's an interesting proxy for the way we construct our organizations. Like, who are we expecting to show up to work? And one of my favorite uh, stories on this is that the United States Senate the Senate building in Washington, D.C. did not have a ladies' room until 1992. I guess they weren't expecting any women to show up. But when organizations at large did recognize that different types of people were showing up, people of different genders and different colors and different sexual orientations, they came through the portal of HR. So HR decided they were going to take this mandate. And this is where I want you to focus on the power of language. Back 25, 30 years ago, when these were in the nascent stages of an initiative, this idea of tolerance came to be. Like, you were supposed to tolerate people who were different than you. And what an awful word. And then over time, that kind of morphed into diversity. We were going to celebrate diversity. And those who were working back then, I'm older than most of you in this room, but there was a sense of this beautiful mosaic. And everyone was a piece of that mosaic. And if, unless you were the wrong color or shape in that mosaic, you probably didn't feel quite as included. But when then we moved into inclusion, which is what the language that we talk about now as we're creating diverse forces that are uh, inclusive. But there's a real business rationale. And by keeping it in HR, I think we missed the point that the changing demography is really creating a, a true business sense of why you need to change. Your workforce is changing. Your client base is changing. The cities in which you live are changing quickly. I live in Los Angeles. To think of that city as a largely Anglo place is incorrect. It's mostly Latino, Asian, and Anglo, right? But the paradigm that was established long ago typically reflects what happens inside corporations. The way we promote people, the way the performance appraisal process works, is based on a paradigm that was largely white, straight, and male. So people who don't fit that often feel ill at ease. But there is demonstrable evidence that more diverse boards create better financial returns and take less risk. And we have people that you'll hear from that are working diligently on that. And I think language is very powerful. So we often speak about how we talk to our daughters about you can be anything you want to be when you grow up, and just look around. The opportunities in education are yours. But I think we, we sometimes miss the chance to speak to our sons to get them to expect people who are different, that women can be their boss and friend and colleague, as well as, as the way they've been viewed historically. So in Singapore, when we had our Asia Summit a few months ago, I gave a talk on gender. And as we're a uh, public nonprofit, we make all those available. And the interesting, interesting thing happened. I received dozens and dozens of emails from strangers, from women who had somehow seen this video and wanted to reach out and share their story. And one, well, I'll change the name for this purpose, but I got an email from Chris Cooper. And Chris wrote me an email and said that she had just recently been on an interview for a relatively senior role, because she was coming from a senior role at a financial institution on Wall Street. And she sat in the room waiting for the, the person to come in. The guy came in, walked out, came back in, and said, are you Chris Cooper? And she said, I am. And he said, well, you should stop pretending to be someone else. You should put Christine on your resume. And she, and she concluded by saying, this didn't happen 10 years ago. This happened two weeks ago. 
And she was already a senior vice president at an organization. So she said, well, didn't, wasn't my resume, the qualifications that were detailed there, the reason that I'm sitting in front of you? And he said, I still feel you're being deceitful. So needless to say, she decided that was not the opportunity for her. <laughs> so as much as that was distressing me as I was getting these emails, something else positive happened about a month ago, and it was here in the UK, and many of you may have seen it. There was a lesson being taught in the school, and they were learning different sounds. And the sound they were focused on was the U-R sound, er. And the children were receiving a worksheet, and they had to write down what the answer was. And the clue, this one, was a lady who works in a hospital. And while the teacher was expecting nurse, the student wrote surgeon, which I thought was a great move towards progress. Uh, so with that, and hopefully on an optimistic note, I want to bring up our, our first speaker. We're mixing up the format a little bit today, so we're going to have two uh, small TED-like speeches first, and then we'll go to a panel. So Asya, can you come up? Thank you. I love it how he didn't even bother trying with my last name. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm extremely fortunate to be in the business of recognizing and investing in great ideas and great companies. And today, I'm honored to be in your company and to have the chance to share beliefs that I'm personally deeply invested in around reaching gender equity in business. Let's apply some analytics to the issue. One, it's old. No, it's ancient. And it's pervasive. With the exception of a very few cultures, women have been undervalued and underpaid, or unpaid, since the first cavemen decided to pick up a club instead of helping pick up around the cave. And secondly, if you're looking for a solution and a payoff, you'd better take the long view. The World Economic Forum released a report last year that found gender equality in the workplace won't happen before 2186. 2186. I know we're living longer, but if that research is right, I will be 206 by the time the fight is won on a global scale. So knowing that the work will be protracted and the ultimate resolution will be post-mortem, how do we live and work to make important changes now? This I know, mountains are not moved by the meek. Consider what's happened since women talked back in a collective voice against sexual assault and predatory behavior. Me Too found a way to crowdsource personal pain and fear and turn it into an avalanche of energy and action. Each of us is here because we have the stomach to do what it will take to change the world of work for women. But what I would ask is this. Please don't think that speaking in a collective voice means everyone needs to follow the same script. Make room for differences in opinions and tactics, even as we work towards the same end. I've been very vocal in my opposition to the idea of women-only businesses, which is a very hot topic in Los Angeles, where I live. Women-only workspaces, women-only startups. That said, let me be very clear, I do want to see more women founders, more women-led venture funds, more women executives, but I firmly believe that we should be wary of creating cloistered work environments where more ends up actually changing less. That's why my company invests in businesses led by women as well as men. Female-led businesses go a long way towards changing perceptions, but it's equally important that women are executives and directors in businesses run by men. Maximizing exposure to capable women creates an expectation that there is more where that came from, and that is truly something to invest in. I say that knowing that I've been fortunate to form Muse Capital in partnership with a creative, driven, and extremely capable woman business partner. Rachel and I created Muse Capital during my recovery from a double mastectomy, and it was the best medicine I could have had. As too many of you know, cancer is the ultimate disruptor of a well-laid life plan. But being forced into a big timeout afforded me real opportunities to reflect on critical truths and consider how I wanted to live and work moving forward. So as lucky as I feel to be asked to speak here, the fact that I'm talking about women in business instead of just business makes me, frankly, a little bit crazy. 
because I think we should be talking about diverse executive empowerment, not female executive empowerment. Diverse executive empowerment includes women, but it opens the door even wider to include more. With a truly diverse executive team, companies can rapidly escalate changes in the workplace and significantly increase their value. So what does true diversity look like? First, let's talk about what it isn't. Leadership roles held predominantly by men. Filling executive positions with women who are expected to think and act in lockstep with their male peers. Checking the we are diverse box without ever really thinking outside of it. And let's now re-envision the boardroom table. Who has a seat? Women, surely. We are, after all, half of the population. But gender-neutral or transgender individuals, too. Obvious examples of people who you rarely find on a corporate board. And women and men with differing racial, ethnic, religious, and socioeconomic backgrounds who can bring varying perspectives and skills to the table. Once the leadership team truly reflects the world outside the company, the playing field is leveled and the game radically changes. But diverse executive empowerment only works when it is part of a bigger, broader move to obliterate the notion that business is a man's world whose top rungs are populated by a type of man. And this needs to change not in all businesses, not just some. I've been really fortunate to be part of that kind of change. I was the first woman on the board of Italy's venerable soccer club, Juventus. Even though its nickname is the old lady, Juventus is a male football club in a male-dominated industry with a boardroom full of men. My father, who is here today, was mystified at first as to why I'd been drafted. But Juventus's president, Andrea Agnelli, believes that a management team should represent the world we live in today, not the one that the old lady was born into. Joining the Juventus board was a differentiating moment for my career, absolutely. And I was acutely aware of the significance of the opportunity. But starting with my very first day at the job, it was clear that my gender would be a non-issue. What mattered most was, and is, the work and the results. That is true gender equity in action. And by the way, real diversity in the workplace isn't always pretty, but it can sometimes be hilarious. At my first Juventus board meeting after my breast cancer surgery, I suddenly noticed the entire room of men were staring at me with a collective look of discomfort. Only then did I realize that I was unconsciously rubbing my new post-mastectomy breasts, or lack thereof, underneath my blouse. Not the most subtle way to break down gender barriers, <laughs> but the nerves in my chest were twitching and aching as they tried to, hide, to fire and heal. I was really embarrassed, as you can imagine, but at its center, Juventus is a place that celebrates physicality. It just happened that I accidentally introduced new parts to the existing playbook. The nature of that playbook and the notes that I've scribbled into it is why I'm here today. Quotas have long been viewed as a game changer, but the pushback has always been, why should a company be forced to hire a less qualified woman over a more qualified man? And frankly, a lot of women candidates have resented being seen as just filling a slot. But if quotas are used correctly, they can actually reconstruct those perceptions. Employers rarely find out at the last minute that they have to hire a woman. So why not start searching for the right female candidate well in advance of the hiring process? By planning to hire a woman from the start, the employer dramatically increases the odds of finding the perfect candidate. She accepts the offer, excels in her position, and shows her value. And gender diversity becomes the norm. The fact is, companies may need the hiring discipline that quotas offer until they really have diversity hiring embedded in their culture. And then quotas can go away. Look at what has happened in just over a decade in Norway. In 2006, Norway introduced a whopping 40% quota for female directors of listed companies. 
Opponents predicted a flood of underqualified women clamoring for top positions. But the exact opposite happened. In fact, today in Norway, women board members are more likely to have a degree than their male counterparts. So will there come a time when women can get these positions without quotas being in place? Yes. But I can tell you that for that, three things have to happen. First, men in power positions have to consciously change their internal biases to alter their decision making. Secondly, the most effective agents for that change are women already in positions to know of and advocate for other women to join their ranks. And thirdly, more women involved in the venture landscape. At Muse Capital, we are big supporters of more women in our space because we know that the more women involved in startup funding decisions, the more the startup landscape will dramatically change. To label this a move to political correctedness is wrong from every angle. This is good business, a pragmatic, informed view of the marketplace that offers more, not less, room for growth, innovation, and profit. In the US, we're currently working with several credible female and minority-led managers like cross-culture ventures, or our friends at Google Ventures who have, the, who have side funds focused on minority entrepreneurs. The UK is sadly a few steps behind. As of yet, it has very few funds led by managers who themselves represent the diverse world that we are living in and want to invest in. I hope that Muse Capital can be part of leading by example. We invest in great companies led by great leaders with the expectation that they will perform. So no, we do not invest in women only. We don't want just diversity at the founder level. We want truly diverse management teams because we know that the diversity is linked with performance. And if the company needs assistance in actually achieving that diversity, we help them. So will we conquer gender equity in our lifetime? For my part, I'm heavily invested in increasing the pace of change. I think we can make dramatic strides if we start making decisions that are practical and based on what truly works, rather than emotional or political. I am fully committed to having my work and my business be part of a seismic shift in executive management diversity. And looking at all of you, I'm optimistic that we're in very good company. I am excited about the business of tomorrow, and I have great hopes that the next time we meet, we will have expanded our conversation around diverse executive empowerment and actually have added some seats at the table. Thank you. <laughs> you want me to stay? I see it. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, I don't know if many of you may have seen in Sunday's New York Times, Sally Krawcheck, who I worked for for many years, uh, wrote an op-ed about even having been one of the most senior people on Wall Street was having difficulty attracting capital to her new venture, largely because she was a woman. At Muse Capital, can you give us some ideas or pointers for people who are looking for capital that might be women? Uh, who, the women who are looking for capital, yeah. certainly look at um, minority-led funds. Most of them are in the States, unfortunately, but I'm hoping that that will change in Europe. Um, and otherwise, try and find a male champion within those venture funds who is open to hearing you out. Or reach out to people like me. We are always listening and opening our, our emails and, and uh, happy to connect with women founders and giving them advice. Um, but certainly, it'll help when there are more women-led, minority-led investment funds, for sure. Great. All right. Thank you so much. And turn it over to Ashley, would you come up? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Have you experienced injustice? I suspect you all have at some point in your lives. I'm going to talk with you about my personal story and experiences with injustice and how I learned to live with it. My parents came from Turkey, and my four siblings and I were born in Germany and grew up there. My father was an entrepreneur and worked very hard. My, my mother was a schoolteacher. 
Later on, she decided to give all her attention to us five kids. Love, tolerance, respect for all human beings, and kindness were indispensable values which my parents set an example for us on a daily basis. <clears throat> Even so, we obviously evoked a lot of hate in our neighborhood. And it was clear by the looks and comments we received that we were not welcome. The good schools we went to were mostly attended by Germans with German ancestry. Many times I was discriminated against by teachers in school for my Turkish heritage, and many of them tried to pre prevent mine and my siblings' entrance into college by mostly discouraging us and giving lower grades than we deserved, based on comparison with other classmates. All this was disturbing, yet as long as I came home, and was with my mom, dad, and siblings. Everything was okay. I felt safe. I was happy. Until the 18th of February <clears throat> of 1994, on our usual family Friday evening. Sorry. <clears throat> on our usual family Friday evening, when we were together preparing dinner and watching a movie. I was 12 years old. The door rang. I went to open the door, and there stood the boyfriend of our neighbor. He had previously attacked us, saying that we should go back home and leave Germany. So there he was, the same neighbor. I called for my father, saying that there was a man at the door. When my father came to the door, this neighbor suddenly had a gun in his hand, aimed at us, and he started shooting immediately, one bullet after another. My father pushed me aside with one hand and slammed the door with the other hand at the same time. The bullets went through the wooden door. My father was shot in his stomach, and I was shot in my arm. Our father died when the ambulance arrived. The whole local, local and national media, with only one exception, omitted the racist motive behind the murder. At the court, there was no justice. The murderer was treated like a victim, and we like the perpetrator. The murderer was convinced to nine years and was released a few years early. This is the punishment in Germany for murdering a Turkish man and shooting a 12-year-old Turkish girl. There was no justice for the life of my father and the destruction of a family. This was racism in the court of justice. My father is my hero. He saved my life. Without him, I wouldn't be here today. My mother is my idol, my heroine. She fought to get justice. <clears throat> she tried to build a new life for us kids, us five kids, all by herself. Everything I have learned about breaking barriers and standing up for the right things in life, I have learned from her. She never let us ever give up. She motivated us and gave us self-confidence. She always treated us and everyone around her with love, she always talked about the good occasions she had with Germans around her. She did not allow us to grow hate towards any nationality and background. She taught us always to look forward and take only good thoughts with us 
and leave the bad feelings behind. Without her kindness, her love, without the strength of my mom, she gave me, I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be who I am. My mother says we have to live to, we have to learn to live with the pain. And this is what we did. I took this pain and decided to do all I could so that fewer people would have to experience this kind of discrimination and injustice. I started studying law, following the footsteps of my sister, who is here today. And later on, I decided to follow my passion as an actor. With acting, we have a chance to reach people all over the world and bring a greater message with the stories we tell and touch, and to touch many hearts. Choosing to work in the kind of movies that remind people that we are all the same in a world where humanity can get lost in the superficial is very important to me. And being the, mis and being the first Miss Germany of Turkish descent, motivating young German women with Turkish roots to position themselves in society and in public life as well. Playing Anne Frank on stage in a one-woman show and touring with it for two years from Luxembourg, Prague, Frankfurt, Los Angeles at the Museum of Tolerance convinced me that, we, that it is never enough to tell true stories. We should never forget and we can learn from them. When I visit schools and talk about, experience, about my experiences and life lessons with young adults and children, my message is simple. Follow your heart and hold on your values, and do not allow negative words to affect you. In 2010, I was asked to become, to become an honorary crime prevention ambassador at the Ministry of Justice Hessia in Germany. My work as an ambassador is to play an active role in crime prevention projects. We support education of young children and teach them that violence of any kind is neither a solution nor a good life strategy. We all can be ambassadors, every day, everywhere, and with every, everyone in our own way. We should never be silent in the face of injustice no matter what kind. Preventing discrimination is everyone's responsibility. We must be willing to be role models, encourage more women to be, models, to be role models in leadership positions. There is a world out there starving for female leadership. I was lucky. My mom was clearly my role model. Yet there are millions of children who lack this kind of support. When a woman is empowered and educated, all of her children will benefit. Making a difference in the world is not only a wonderful opportunity, but also a great responsibility. I wish for all of us and the generations to come an end of violence and a future where religion, origin, looks and gender simply express our individuality and diversity. It is a long journey, yet every little step here is a big step. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much for bravely sharing that story in such a personal way. Uh, can you just comment for us how, having gone through that and then founding the strength to be the advocate that you are today, how does that experience inform your work both as an actor and, and fighting for in, against injustice? Uh, for fighting against injustice, um, I think it's clear. I just want, I want, I just want that others, I, I just want to make an impact that others don't have to experience these kind of things. And I believe that young children, it has to start very young and teach them that violence and discrimination, racism, everything is not a solution, and teach them tolerance and kindness. So that's basically 
clear. As an actor, I wish this wouldn't have happened. And I think there are many great actors out there. They didn't have tragedies in their lives. And maybe it would have been better if I wouldn't have uh, this kind of experience. I don't know. I, I wanted to be an actor as a child before that happened. And um, I don't know how to say it. As an actor, you imagine things to happen, even you never lived them. Mm -hmm. And also, m when I act, I never think of my experience, because that would be like playing yourself all the time. Um, I don't know if it's clear what That's I mean. That's great. No, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, thank you very thank much. You. <laughs> okay. And now we're on to our panel. And uh, Yomi, come on. Um, so we have a remarkable group of panelists who, why don't you just come up and join me? Um, I'm going to have them introduce themselves and what they do. Wherever you'd like. So, I mean, um, before you, you give a brief introduction, I'd like to say that these women, of course, grace many stages. Um, and we have um, an opportunity, Richard and I were actually discussing it earlier this morning, which is for us to use these times where we come together with great intentionality. Um, and many of us are aware of the problems, and we will skim over what the, the problems or the issues are. But what I really, truly want to focus on is, um, is the, the solutions. How do we move past? where we currently are, and how do we paint a picture of the future that really calls us all into being um, and, um, and shows the progress that we need in society. So I'll start with you, Jane, if you would briefly introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Jackie Cooper. Um, I'm a senior advisor to Edelman, having sold my business to Edelman uh, 13 years ago. My background's brand, uh, entertainment, uh, PR, and marketing strategy. I also sit on Jamie Oliver's board as an advisor and on a selection of startups. Great, thank you. Hello, good morning. I'm Lynn Franks. Uh, like Jackie, I have a background in PR, but um, I got out some years ago. I'm, <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know if I look any more relaxed than she does, probably not. Um, I wrote a book called The Seed Handbook in 2000, The Feminine Way to Create Business, which was the first time really globally, that a book had been written for women in a very different way on how to start their own sustainable business, their own sustainable enterprise, using the metaphor of nurturing, planting seeds, and running and, and growing a garden, which became the basis of a body of work that's been delivered for literally from African villages and post-war zones to corporate boardrooms. I work um, and in, as an advisor to large companies uh, over the last few years, McDonald's, UK, Tesco's, uh, HSBC, on the whole engagement of women, and um, have sort of really taken it as my life purpose to create gender equality. While we appreciate the differences, whether it be the diversity we heard about this morning, the diversity between men and women, but certainly equality for all from any area of society. And uh, right now, things are looking much better than they did 20 years ago. Hi, I'm Brenda Trinoden. Um, I'm a former emerging markets investment banker and have lived and worked in, uh, in many different countries, including setting up an investment bank in Bangladesh many years ago. Um, I'm now a corporate banker at ANZ by day, but by early morning, late night, and weekend, um, I lead the 30% Club, which is a global campaign to have better balance in senior leadership. And, um, and I also add lately, and, and to our, our first speaker, also a cancer survivor, although currently going through chemo. So um, hopefully carrying on as a cancer survivor. Great. Thank you all so very much. So the first question that I want to ask, which may sound like an obvious question, but I think it's very important that, um, that, we, that we speak to it, is what would each of you say the impact of gender bias is and has been in the corporate sector? So we'll start with you, Brenda. Um, I think looking at it, and, and I sit in financial services where, where we see it quite a lot, but I work with companies in all industries, and I think one of the biggest issues is around culture. And you know, to the point um, that Richard made earlier, 
you know, inclusion. So really having, having all that gender bias and having very dominant cultures that aren't very inclusive um, has created a lot of problems in organizations around employee engagement, around recruiting talent. And to that point, we did some research um, at the 30% Club a couple years ago about university students and looking at where their aspirations were. And we found that across 20,000 students, and, and I come back to financial services where we see a lot of bias, it was the fourth choice for young men, but the 12th choice for young women because they saw it as a very male-dominated industry. So, so I think you know, that's just one example of, of some of the challenges around the biases. Mm -hmm. and, and how about you, Lynn? Um, well, it always has amazed me how um, so many large corporates, particularly consumer-faced corporates, who are selling, at the end of the day, to women, don't consider that perhaps women should, could and should be better at communicating, understanding what's going on in a, in a woman's head. I mean, I'm sure we've both got experience of that. So on that level alone, but clearly a balanced board of directors, gender and, and wherever else it goes, is going to be a more efficient company. There is no question about it, and the research has been done to prove that. Um, and so to have all aspects of um, gender and diversity on the decision making um, of large companies is only going to result in better results. <laughs> and that has not been the case. And that is why we have, in so many situations, a broken system, which I will talk about a bit more, but I feel very passionately about at the moment. We are living in a world that is running on a broken system, whether it be capitalism, politics, or anything else. We can see it every day. We open the newspapers, we turn on the television, and we're living in some kind of denial to think everything is OK and it's going to be the same. And part of that is this lack of equality so that people, everybody, men, women, everybody has a say in how we make decisions and leadership. Mm -hmm. Very briefly, would you touch upon what the, the brokenness looks like? Well, I don't think I have to touch on it. As I said, I think you just have to open up the newspapers every day and turn on the television. Um, and the fact that we are in denial, and we're seeing what's going on in our country, in this country alone, with politics and decision-making and games that are being played. You go to the, I work a lot at grassroots. I live out of London these days. I work in the grassroots, and people have the, pe the people, i.e. the people that vote in politicians, for example, have absolutely no confidence, whatever parties they may have followed in the past, that things are going to change. They don't connect with the corporate world. They connect very, very little, really, to consumer brands. There is no connection going on. There's complete disconnect. So that broken system um, can, only be sh can only shift when there is a much more collaborative, cooperative society, which we do not have at the moment, and the basis for which is communications and sharing and telling stories, and coming together in groups, gatherings in groups. So I work in small groups, large groups, but it's actually by taking off the mask. I mean, the two stories we heard this morning were both so moving, and it was because they were moving, it was because they were personal, that we all engaged and we really heard what you have both had to say. And um, that's... I'm not saying that every board meeting has got to sit down with the, with the group, share a candle and a meditation, but it wouldn't be so bad either. <laughs> Great. And Jackie? Yeah, I completely agree with uh, what Lynn said about the mystified sort of impact, I think, that many of us have um, when we look at the fact that there are so many companies who are trying to attract women as cons customers and consumers, and yet at board level there aren't women, uh, there's not a women's presence, there's not a women's voice. And there's quite often an acknowledgement of that, but not necessarily a plan in mm -hmm. place to, to rectify. Um, one of the companies that I advise is a company called Kidzania. I don't know how many of you have heard of it. It's a really uh, cute offer, uh, a little two-thirds of real-size village city that's built um, that kids can go in and explore a variety of careers and jobs. Um, so it looks like a mini shopping mall, but instead of shopping, you're actually experiencing a raft of different jobs. And you can go into the veterinary surgery as a little kid and learn how to be a vet, and you can go into a hospital and learn how to be a doctor, and you can go into a Formula One um, racetrack and learn how to be a racer. Guess how many women go, uh, guess how many girls go into the Formula One racetrack? Uh, none, unless they're encouraged mm -hmm. to. 
So Kidzania have just done a gender bias study, and um, Gare Graus, who's their global minister of education, which is a great title for a company, um, has this great phrase that said, you can't uh, aspire to what you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as the girls were told that they could equally go to all of the places in Kidzania that seemed to be the boys' places, they all went for it. And I think that it's about equal opportunity and and confidence. And what I see a lot, um, I had my own business, which I sold to Edelman. Uh, we had 75 people when we sold probably three quarters women. Um, I had an exhibition business that I sold that was probably three quarters men. Um, uh, in Edelman, we're growing to um, get to the 50-50 uh, gender uh, number, EVP and above. But what I see is that women don't get to a certain point and then they stop when it gets to be senior. They stop when it gets to be properly senior. And um, one of the guys that organizes the Cannes Lions, which is a massive festival, global festival of creativity that takes place in Cannes and represents the agencies from all around the world, told me that quite often when they try and get speakers to go on the platform at Cannes, which is an extraordinary platform for brands and corporations um, to sort of really find out what's happening next. They'll go to a woman, it's going to drive Lynn mad, and then the woman will put forward a man above them. Mm. And it's like, why aren't you standing up on the stage and doing it? And if you need help in doing it, get the help. And um, I hosted Will Smith on the stage a couple of years ago and was totally petrified. He was, of course, cool with being on the stage. I wasn't. And I thought, right, instead of being pathetic, I need to go and get some training. And I went to RADA and learned to breathe <laughs> and hoped that I wouldn't either vomit or throw up or, or pass out in front of Will Smith and 3,000 people. But I had a wonderful lady in our marketing department who said, Jackie, just go and get some help. So I think that this confidence is so much of it. I completely agree with Brenda about uh, culture. Culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? And we have to have the culture that women feel that they can and they will. Because if they can, they will. Mm -hmm. So um, you touched upon Jackie having a plan in place. And, and Asya, in your, in your speech, you spoke about three points. So I'd love to hear three points from you each um, as to how you believe we can once and for all overcome gender bias? Just three. <laughs> just three, in the interest of time. I'm you know, if kidding. it were left I'm to me, we'd be here I'm all kidding. day. Well, I think to, <laughs> just to follow on from, from Jackie's point, um, an interesting thing, and, and we talk a lot in the 30% Club about sponsorship versus mentorship. And I think that really comes out in terms of looking at as you get to senior levels, needing that person who's going to advocate on your behalf and really publicly speak up for you, open doors for you and things. And you know, we find that men tend to have sponsors more naturally than women. Women have a lot more mentors, and mentors you know, don't risk their reputation. They're not publicly advocating for you. They're giving you advice. But a sponsor really puts their neck on the line for you. And to your point, Jackie, there was a, a great piece of research done recently in the US by Corn Ferry and Rockefeller 100 by 25, where they interviewed all of the existing and former female CEOs of Fortune, um, I think it was Fortune 1000 companies. And what they found was over half of them would never have gone for the role of CEO if someone hadn't suggested that to them that they could do it and, and push them into doing it. And speaking to some of the female CEOs here in the UK, they've said the same thing. They would have never considered themselves as a CEO, but someone, usually a man, came along and said, you would be fantastic in that role. You need to go for it. And they coached them, they helped them, and they, they pushed them forward. So I think you know, sponsorship is a really, really critical thing. Mm -hmm. And the best companies look at how they can help to really facilitate that. I think another thing, and, and this applies to all diversity, is the whole role model piece and gender stereotypes and norms. And you know, once again, as you pointed out, Jackie, you need, you need to see it to be it. Yeah. And a really interesting piece um, was recently um, HSBC did this video that, that went completely viral, where two women in their Taiwanese office um, were getting married. And the father of, of the bride, um, one of the brides, did, did not want to walk the bride down the aisle. So the CEO of HSBC Taiwan walked her down the aisle, and they did a video of it. And this went all over HSBC, and it was phenomenal because in Taiwan, they, they couldn't be recognized officially as, as two women getting married. 
Their colleagues thought it was amazing that the CEO was there and, and was, was actually participating in the wedding and walking them down the aisle. But I think it opened up to the whole of the HSBC community that this was, this was now a norm, two women getting married in Taiwan. And I think there's a lot to be said about you know, profiling and, and making things very public. I mean, someone mentioned this morning about a man who's working three days a week, very senior in, in a big US company, and he didn't want anyone to know about it, which is the opposite of what we need to do. I know it at Aviva, the, the most senior job share at Aviva is two men who are, are job sharing, and they're very publicly sharing that so that everyone in the company knows this isn't a female thing. So, so my second piece is, is really around that. And then the third is, is around language and, and really subtle things. So a lot of companies now, if they have a job advert and they're, you know, they're hiring internally or externally, they will put that through an online tool. And there are lots of free tools um, where they can look to see if, if they have gender-specific language in there that might put off certain candidates. And I'm sure that there are lots of other aspects to language as well that, that can look across the whole diversity spectrum. But it's very subtle things like that that people need to think about. So, so those would just be three that I think are quite powerful that can make a big difference. Essential. Thank you. I'm going to, Lynn, I'm going to um, actually add something else onto the question for you because we, we do have to talk about Me Too. So I want to also find out from you the avenues that you think that Me Too opens up for systemic change? Well, I suppose the, the clear avenue is that it has given women the confidence to speak out. Mm -hmm. um, as, as unpleasant as all the stories have been that have been coming out across the sec different sectors, the fact that it's happening, has happened rather, um, and, has, and these people have been outed is incredibly important. It, it, more than anything, it is a time when we say power cannot abuse and that women can get together collectively and say a, a little tag like Me Too has become a war cry, really. Not war cry, that's the wrong uh, metaphor, but it, it's certainly become a statement for women and men to stand up and say no more. So very healthy in that respect. And I sincerely hope that it continues and grows and... That we talked about a cultural shift. This is part of the big cultural shift. It is absolutely appalling when you start scraping through the surface of, of how many people, women particularly, have experienced this kind of abuse from power. So that absolutely is enormously important timing of this conference, this conversation we're having now. Let us hope that everybody in this room goes out even more um, passionate than when they came in, let's say, um, about the fact that abusive power in any shape or form has got, or the abuse of power has got to stop. Um, and unfortunately, the sort of linear hierarchical structures of corporations, governments, and so on, sort of allows, it kind of lends to allowing that kind of abuse. So I'm a great believer in um, very big cultural shift and much more circular style of management and leadership within corporations and anywhere else, so that, that it becomes less linear in the first place. I do believe in job share very strongly. I also believe that if there are groups within corporations that need their own space to come together and share and support each other. I think they should. My work's been with women for the last 20 years, and I know that women need their own space to share. And that doesn't mean that they don't, they're anti-men. There can be other groups of men and women in them. Men might say, well, what about us? Well, that's fine. Go and do it. But I know I've had so much experience from women in, well, women in prisons don't have much choice, but we're right the way through to corporate, that, that women need that very safe space to share and be themselves. So I think that corporates have got to allow, whether it be women or whether it be other diversity groups, that they have that space for... for and most important, of, call, of course, is that any change at cultural level has got to be led by all the work you're doing, CEO and chairman, chairwoman, change of language, sure. chair, yeah. um, because if the, if the top leaders don't show that they are absolutely behind and supporting this, which is when I went into McDonald's UK year, quite a few years ago and set up a women's leadership network there, it, it was taken seriously to a degree by the company because the CEO said we're doing it, the male CEO said we're doing it, even though the men within the company, certainly at the beginning, were very cynical and made life very uncomfortable for the women that were taking, going into that space. That, is, that has shifted a lot, but this was quite a few years ago. It has to come from the top, absolutely, absolutely. which is all the work you're doing, yeah. which is so incredible. And 
one final point is that uh, uh, why are there not more women speaking up? As you pointed, Jackie, why are there not more women taking CEO jobs? The reality is, sorry to say, that many women decide at a certain age, not because they want to go off and have babies, but purely because the environment they work in doesn't reflect their values. They want to be in a different situation. It's not just women, I know that, but a lot of women decide they want to leave and they want to start a different, they want to live in a different world and they want to start their own business. Technology's given us freedom. They can be at home, you can have your babies, you can start your business. You can still work as an advisor to the company that used to employ you. There is choice now, we have freedom. And I don't believe it's just because women want to go off and have children and retire from the corporate world. It's because we want to do things in a different way. There is change coming, brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open, it's on its way, it's here. <laughs> Fantastic. Jackie. Um, yeah, I, I was actually going to say that I think it has to come from the top. Uh, Rich Edelman um, has three daughters, which helps, because um, he's obviously surrounded by strong women in his life. <laughs> um, I think that um, uh, was something quite telling that sort of really has stayed in my mind is that we have uh, what we call GWEN, the Global Women's uh, Edelman Network, um, as a support service, as a motivator, um, and having very clear goals on training, gender bias training, um, how we actually offer more part-time work, maternity leave, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the lady in London that runs that group, we have different people in different offices, obviously you know, a number of offices, 6,000 people around the world, it's quite a lot of people, um, put out, can you let me know if you haven't got a hashtag Me Too story to tell, mm -hmm. if you've never had a hashtag Me Too experience? Thundering silence. Nothing. <laughs> And so I got a bit obsessed with this and started asking people. And it's literally like taking the lid off some god-awful box because everyone has an experience. And I think that that's something that's going to be fundamentally the barometer of whether this changes, is that young women shouldn't have these experiences. And I think that um, when I was appointed to our executive committee, I was, I was really pleased, but frankly, it was never my ambition to be on the executive committee. It was my ambition to do the work, and I loved the job. I wasn't particularly hierarchical. I think when you've had two businesses, that changes for you. Um, and I was absolutely amazed by the amount of emails I got from women in the firm who said, it's so great that you're on XCOM. It's so great. It makes me feel like I can get on XCOM. And it actually made me rethink about this as an achievement. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that the key thing is that businesses don't shift by talking. They only actually shift hardcore corporations if they have measurable KPIs. Mm -hmm. And that has to be into, into businesses. We have to have the understanding, we have to have the sharing. As Lynn said, it's important people have a voice. We have to have the sponsorship, we have to have the mentorship, but we also have to have the hardcore, practical measurements, objectives, and the kind of services that women can rely on that enables them to feel that there's equal opportunity. We're not all equal, but we all do deserve equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in speaking about hardcore measurements, um, in one minute each, would you please share what it is that you're doing individually outside of your professional lives, or I guess as an extension of your professional lives, to, to support the advancement of women? And we'll start with in the uh, In the 30% Club, um, we advocate targets. And so the first thing we say is that the chair on their board have to set a target, and 30% is the minimum, not, where we, not the end game. And now we're asking CEOs to set a 30% target in their exec teams. But further from working with the companies now, the, the biggest, most exciting piece is we're working with the asset owners and asset managers. So we have a huge investor group in the UK, one in Australia, Canada, and a growing group in the US, where they're actually sitting down with the companies that they own, and they're asking them, why have you not set these targets? What is your succession planning? Why does your you know, executive team look all the same, and, and really having those investors now start to, um, I don't want to say activate, because we don't want to use the word activist at all, but, but they're agitating for change and actually voting against the chairs and the chairs of the nomcos where they're not seeing a difference. Mm -hmm. And so they're really using that 30% yardstick to measure companies and look at which ones they're going to go in and speak to. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't agree more. Um, metrics are incredibly important. Fantastic. Um, 
Yes. 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 Okay. So uh, I'm a great believer in think local, act global. So I've moved to uh, Somerset, where I have started a well-being. I'm in the process of starting a well-being community hub, which is women's led, which has been something I've wanted to do for a very long time. And I'm also creating a new body of work, which is I'm calling the Power of Seven, and it, it is. Um, uh, using the archetypes, ancient archetypes, feminine archetypes, like, uh, well, they're not strictly feminine, but storyteller, um, alchemist, seed sower, and so on, um, which are all part of us in the modern world, even though they're based on um, traditional um, imagery, um, and how that can work in a group of seven. So on a local basis, I'm working with, uh, in various towns around where I live, um, groups of seven women, because I've been workshopping it all summer, everywhere from Glastonbury Festival to... Um, well, a whole variety of places, actually, on what happens when groups of seven women come together and how they all take roles and uh, responsibilities and can create change, whether it's social action in corporations and so on. And the number seven has been researched, which I found out afterwards, as the strongest uh, number to have in a group to make change. On a, na on a global level, I'm working with ActionAid, um, and we're looking at the moment on the whole area of, or the whole humanitarian sector, which ActionAid believe is still um, not equal in terms of gender balance and leadership, and that is why a lot of women's issues, um, very serious women's issues, including sexual violence, don't get uh, looked after the way they should. So we're now working on a global plan um, on uh, working with women in disaster areas, possibly bringing the, the seven concept in, but in other ways of creating um, an awareness and uh, support for women's groups in disaster areas. And I'm also working on a global environmental campaign with another big organization, which is all very much including the equality of women and children and just one, and women and girls. And just one last point is uh, you may all be aware, or some of you may be aware, that um, the UN did some research a year or so ago, which showed that the future of this world is becoming a place where we all would like to live, where there is peace and where there is harmony and there is safety and abundance for all, will be based on the future of the young girls who are 11 years old right now because it's when we get the balance in the world of the 11 year old girls so that all right there's one thing in this country or the countries you come from but the amount of 11 year old girls that are currently not educated sold into slavery sexual slavery married off young um, certainly have had no education when that is balanced out far beyond the worlds that we live in or in today but in the big picture of the world when we can really create gender equality in every single strata of society we will have a world where we want and I certainly want my grandchildren which I have seven to grow up in so it's we have to kind of go beyond our we have to work within our own obviously capacity but we have to never stop thinking globally and think of what it's like for people that are um, a lot less um, a lot less what it, have a lot less opportunities. I can't even get the word out. I feel so emotional. But a lot less opportunities than we do, put it that way. Okay, and Jackie, lastly, Jackie. Yeah, um, I do a lot of men mentoring, um, and, uh, and I think uh, one of the things that I do, which I think we can all do, and we underestimate how valuable it is, and I'm not saying that say I'm so great, because I'm so not, but just the feedback that I get is that... Um, I've been very blessed in my life that I've had many people take me under their wing. The first person who made me believe um, that I could do anything was my father. And um, he was an older father. This sort of Everyone thought he was my grandfather. So a generation born in 1915, a generation that wasn't brought up to believe that, you know, women could do everything. But he always made me feel that everything um, was possible. And he gave me a piece of advice, which is, Jackie, always meet everybody once. Mm -hmm. which I have kept up, uh, uh, obviously no longer with, with us on this mortal coil, but uh, I share that with the people that I, I mentor, and I actually try and help network uh, with, with the women that I, I mentor, because I find that the more people you meet and the more people you can get advice from and the more uh, sort of, you know, your network can grow, the more your confidence and your ability grows, and certainly that's been 100% behind my success. I'm badly educated, I didn't go to university, I had my own business by 23, and I could 100% say that all of my success is down to the care and love and advice that I've had from, from mentors over the years. So I would advise and heartily ask that all of you do that too. Pass it on, pay it forward. Meet everyone once. <laughs> do we have time for questions? Okay, we do not. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>